day. So we took off cross country through a big cornfield, came up onto the highway, and like true Americans, we started hitchhiking. Well, it wasn't more than one or two minutes before a police car pulled up. And the, uh, the, the policeman got us into the police car. We didn't know what was happening. Took us in the opposite direction, and there was a police roadblock. They were checking for drunk drivers. And there was a captain in charge of the roadblock. So Henry and I get out of the police car, and almost immediately I start trying to explain to the police captain um, who we were and what we were up to. And in the midst of all this, I, I was saying, and, and we're in a German band, and we're the ones who, uh, in Rothenburg, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, we played a little concert there, and the captain put up his hand. He said, Ja, und mit out a permit. Well, I didn't know what to expect after that. But captains stopped all the traffic, went down the line of drivers, checked every driver's license until he found one that the a car driven by two young fellas and their address was fairly near to the hotel where Henry and I were staying. So he commandeered that car and drivers. He told the driver, I know where you I know your name and I know where you live and you're gonna take these two fellows, these two Americans, to their hotel and stay there until they're inside, make sure that they're safe. So we got in the back seat of the um this car and these two young fellows were scared to death. They never said a word to us. Pulled it. We finally got to Rothenburg, pulled up in front of the hotel. We got out, rang the bell, woke up the, the night porter. He came, opened the door, we went inside and then their car pulled away. The first time we ever really did have uh, uh, any relationship with the band was uh, uh, in Innsbruck. Uh, we marched in a parade in the afternoon in Innsbruck, and uh, uh, there was a, a band from Innsbruck playing in the parade also called the Maria Hilfe Band from a neighborhood of Inns Innsbruck up on the mountainside. And then we uh, wound up at their civic center and uh, both Little German Band and the Maria Hilfe Band played. And uh, we played uh, Mirzain de Kaiser, der Kaiser Jaeger, and I like to have a lot of uh, tempo changes in that number, and, and in fact, brought the band to a complete stop at one point uh, in, in playing it. And uh, so that was just one of the numbers we played. And then the Maria Hilfe band played, and then they invited us to go to their band director's tavern. Now that's a real band director who has his own neighborhood tavern. So we went there, and we stayed really late that night in a little residential neighborhood. And the next day we played the parade again with the Maria Hilfe band, went to the, to the um, uh, Civic Center and played our little concerts. But uh, when the Maria Hilfe band played, they invited me up on stage and I put the band director's uh, jacket on. It weighed a ton. And, and so I directed a couple numbers, and then, then for, at the end of the concert, they played Mirzain der Kaiser Jaeger, and they played it exactly the way that we did. They liked it so much with all those tempo, tempo variations that they played it the same way. That was the first band we ever had any relationship really with. It was in later years that uh, uh, w mostly, I think, uh, um, uh, through um, uh, contacts with uh, people that had come over here that we started making arrangements where we could actually visit and stay with bands over there. That really didn't start till much uh, later um, in, the, um, in the late 80s um, and early 90s is when that really got underway. Let me ask you one. Well, there was always a lot of, a lot of uh, fun going on uh, during the sessions and uh, afterwards, in between, during the breaks. Uh, the one thing that I remember, it's a, it's a little off color, uh, was um, 
There, there's a piece that I guess is still in the books, uh, So Lang der Alte Peter. And uh, it, it uh, is actually a theme song of, of uh, the city of Munich. And uh, <clears throat> Peter, which is Peter, refers to a cathedral uh, which incidentally was partly destroyed during the war, during the bombing, uh, was rebuilt. And uh, the theme of the song is, uh, as, as long as uh, the old Peter Cathedral stands, um, the, the Gemütlichkeit in Munich will never end. And um, when this piece was announced, uh, somebody, and frankly, I don't remember who it was, gets up and said, uh, uh, the next piece uh, is dedicated to uh, uh, who was the guy? The the urologist, and uh, that that got a few laughs. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, in in connection with. The, the name of that cathedral, which uh, in, in German doesn't have the connotation it, it does in English. Um. I'd like to talk about uh, one funny thing that happened uh, in the very early days of the dance group. Um, unknown to everyone else, Jim Walker and I worked together on the fight plattle in which two guys get into a flight, fight and do the Schuplattler number. No one had seen it. No one knew we were doing it. We went over to Winston-Salem to play uh, for a, a big outdoor festival there. And um, Jim and I had arranged that he would do something uh, bad, nonsensical, and I would get mad at him, and drag him into a fight. So I called up a, a number, and just before we start to play, he started to play How Dry I Am real loud on his trumpet. Well, Kathy Heyman was our bells player, and she was right behind him. So he's playing How Dry I Am. She takes her mallet from the bells, and she starts pounding him on the head with this mallet, not knowing that that was part of our little act. Well, then I dragged him down onto the street in front of our stage, and I counted off for the band, and they went into the number that we used for the, for the fight plattle. And Jim and I had, had tried to learn how to do this thing called the Kreutzschlag, where you slap your opposite foot behind your back while you're sort of marching along. Well, somehow we got, we just couldn't do it. And we wound up hitting the wrong, uh, the same foot on the same side we looked like Jerry Lewis having one of his episodes so this one that just really looked we looked so foolish in that whole whole event that was one I mentioned bef before that we played when the Budweiser um, horses were were in North Carolina and um, so the, before the first time that we played for them I wrote a little arrangement of the Budweiser song we practiced it up and um, first off, down in Lexington, uh, at the beer distributors, um, there we, uh, we took off into the Budweiser song and the eight horse hitch and big wagon with two drivers and Dalmatian were off to the side. As soon as we started playing that tune, the, the horses started stomping their hooves and uh, nodding their heads up and down the the Dalmatian started barking, and the, the drivers had to retighten the wheel brakes because everyone was getting excited in the, among the eight horses. Uh, so a couple months later, we were doing the same thing for Budweiser down in Fayetteville, and again, the horses and dog recognized the Budweiser tune. They, they knew it, and that something was going to happen when they heard that. When we went to the World's Fair, um, that was that was a pretty big job for us. Um, uh, Mr. Carey had the Schlitz distributorship in in Raleigh, 
And uh, Dick Clemens drove his uh, uh, motorhome over to Knoxville, and we took uh, a bunch of vans. And we took Dick's car down to the, the distributorship, and Mr. Carey filled the whole car with cases of, of Schlitz. We had like 100 cases in that little car, and then Dick hooked it on behind his uh, uh, motorhome, and pulled that whole thing to, to Knoxville. So uh, we were staying in some uh, townhouses in Oak Ridge. So every day when we finished at the, at the uh, Stroh House at the World's Fair, we lit into all that beer back in, in Oak Ridge. But when we were playing at the Stroh House, <clears throat> we had just gotten the chicken dance. So the Stroh House, Knoxville World's Fair was the first time that the chicken dance was ever played in the United States. Um, we can't even think of how many times it must have, we must have played it since then. The other thing that happened for the first time was they had a bunch of uh, nice girls who were waitresses in the straw house, and when, when we played the Two Fat Polka, that's the first time that we did the gimmick where the guys stood up and pointed at the girls, and then the girls pointed at the guys as being too fat, and we did it with the waitresses at the, at the straw house. So that's the first time that was done also. One of the events that wound up, uh, turned out to be funny in the end was uh, we played for the German club over in Burlington. That German club has now been affiliated into the uh, international club in um, uh, Winston-Salem. But at the time, uh, we went to the Burlington Armory to play an Oktoberfest for the German club. And it was a big event. It was very good. And um, at the end of the job, everyone was loading the equipment back on the bus, getting on the bus. And I went to the office uh, to collect our pay. Well, the fellow in charge wouldn't pay us. He said to his friends, that I had told him the band would stay until the last person went home. Well, obviously this is not correct, but he wouldn't pay us. So I went back out to the bus. I don't know what was on my mind at the time. Climbed up in the, in the bus, and I pointed to George Chris, George Skank, and Frank Noonan, the three biggest guys in the band. And I said, you guys follow me. So here I am, this little guy with these three huge guys behind me. We jumped off the bus and start heading for the office. Well, Frank Noon got off the bus, walked the whole way back, a uh, whole way around the bus, and got back on. He wasn't going to have any part of this. So the three of us go in the office, and we just stand our ground, and we say, you're going to pay us or else. Well, ultimately, after 10 minutes, we did get paid, get back on the bus. About two weeks later, I get a phone call. The wives of these German guys said they wanted to come and see me. So they arrived at my house, about five of them, and they apologized profusely for the behavior of their husbands. And I said, oh, it's okay. No problem, no problem. So of all things, we were invited to come back the next year and play. So when the bus pulled in the parking lot, here's about 20 German ladies in their dirndls with their hankies in their hand, all lined up, waving, waving. And we stopped the bus, we got off the bus, and they all clapped as we got off the bus. And when we left that evening, there they were out there in a line, waving their hankies as we left. And every year thereafter, these ladies went through that same thing of welcoming the band <laughs> to the Oktoberfest in Burlington. One of the things I, I like to talk about is the uh, various sizes of the crowds that the band has played for. I'd like to start off with the smallest crowd we ever played for. In spring of 1971, uh, Carl Zobel arranged for us to ride a float in the Cary uh, Centennial Parade, 
yeah, well, Cary at that time had a total population of 6,700 people. It wasn't a very big place. We didn't have any costumes either, so we just made up things to wear. And we got on this truck that was had some decorations on it. And we were sitting there getting ready for the parade to start. And behind us in the line of parade was a farmer with a mule pulling a an old farm wagon. So before the parade started, this, this farmer came up to me and said, I don't know what's going to happen when you guys start to play music. I don't know what that mule's going to do. I said, okay, we'll check it out. So we got off the truck, went back, made a circle around the mule, a mule standing there with his head down, his eyes closed, he has a straw hat on his head, and long ears sticking up through the straw hat, and we took off into the beer barrel polka. Not a muscle on that mule moved. He didn't twitch. He didn't do anything. Didn't, it was like we didn't even happen. So that was our smallest crowd we ever played for. The next biggest crowd we ever played for was when we were at the, uh, at the uh, uh, festival in uh, Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Uh, we got off our bus, we were on our way to Barnesville, we got off our bus at the front gate, and of course just as we finished getting off the bus, there was an explosion and the, and the front part of the bus sagged down to the ground. And the, uh, air suspension system had blown out. I thought, oh my gosh, now what are we going to do when we finish here at the fair where buses broke down? I looked across the street. There was a huge garage that said bus repair garage across the street. We were saved. We went into the fair while we were wandering around. Here's a band playing German music, wandering around, little five-piece band, and they're playing from the green little German band book. So we follow them around, and we start making requests from this band. Play number 15. Play number 7. They couldn't figure out how we knew what the numbers were in their book. Also at the fair, there's a big six-horse hitch pulling a wagon, and this hitch was driven by Hugo Messerschmitt. So he would drive around the, the fairgrounds there every hour or two, and um, he had a, a tent in which he was keeping all of his horses in between performances, pulling this big wagon. And so we went out, got our instruments, and we came into his stable tent, and there was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hugo Messerschmitt, each on a cot, taking a nap. And they were old folks, so we gathered around their cots, and we broke out into the beer barrel polka again. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Hugo Messerschmitt jumped up and started dancing the polka in the straw among their uh, Percheron horses. That's our second biggest crowd. Our third biggest crowd occurred when we were playing down in Asheboro for the weekend. We played a arts festival, and then we went and played a concert out at the North Carolina Zoo, and then Saturday night we played at the home of the chairwoman of the Asheboro Arts Council. It was out in the country, really nice place, big crowd of people there. And while we were playing, three cows wandered up to the fence. So, as usual, we got our instruments, went down to the fence with the cows, and we made a little circle around these three cows. Now a crowd is up to three. And we played, of all things, the hamburger waltz out of the green book cows seemed to like it, not knowing what the name of the tune was that we were playing. Well, I'll jump to a big crowd that we played for. Uh, one year, classes started at NC State before, I mean, sorry, the, the football game, the first football game was scheduled before classes started at NC State, before the students even came. So here was a football game scheduled with no halftime entertainment. They called the little German band. I said, oh, well, okay, we'll give it a whirl. And here we were, 60-piece band and some dancers, and we went out onto this huge field in front of 47,000 people, and we put on a halftime show. I later ran into somebody who, who I hadn't known at that time, but he said, you were those guys at that football game. He says, we looked down, we couldn't imagine what you were doing down there. 
<laughs> so we did put on a show. We chopped wood and everything right out on the football field. So that was a crowd of 47,000, not too bad. But our biggest crowd actually was one year we were invited to play a halftime show at NC State basketball game in Reynolds Coliseum. 